Were you a guy that was visualizing the shot patterns at all that you were hitting before you hit them? I self-developed that ability to stand. You stand behind the ball and you see the golf ball fly, you see it land. And the important thing is you've got to see it finish. So you cannot tell me you can stand. Nice people are meant to play golf without thinking of anything. Tell us something that nobody's ever heard. You've got to see what you want to do. Most of the time when you're winning or coming up 18, you, you still have got the blinkers on because you, you need four to win when you're not. And I said to Fanny, lift your head up, have a look. Take it in, girl. We won't get a chance like this again. It's just very powerful. If you can do that, stand back, see yourself do it, then you stand up and right. then commit to it. So, so the bottom line is you make a decision, isn't it? Because you, once you've assessed the shot, you've visualized it, and then you know what swing produces that. Yeah, if the voice says, well, that doesn't feel good, you need to do it again. All right, guys, we're back with another Performance Golf podcast. Eric and Donnie here from Performance Golf and joined magically the eye in the sky, Sir Nick Faldo, joining us from, where are you at, Sir Nick? You're in uh, Phoenix? Yeah, Scottsdale. Yeah, I, I, I'll try and tell the story quickly. That you know, The winter last year in Bozeman was unbelievable. You know, we had snow every day. So we made a decision, oh, let's go to Scottsdale in February. So we rented a house. And, of course, Bozeman is gorgeous right now. It's, it was nearly 60 degrees last week. And, um, and here we are, Pro-Am Day in Scottsdale and it's pouring it was hail hailstorm about 10 minutes ago so it's horrible and gray and yucky and we're probably gonna stay a few more days and uh, we had a couple of meetings and then we head back to beautiful sunny Bozeman <laughs> so it's quite funny yeah you got that got the reverse weather yeah, got, it, year, got huh? it wrong so we, we yeah. learned yeah we're was there no snow on the ground when you left Bozeman no we've had, a, we've had an unbelievable winter you know seriously last year because it had record snow I mean, they, they said, oh, you'll get a couple of, you get a foot. Well, we had about four feet of snow. But this year, it snowed, God, it snowed way back, like October, say. That melted. Didn't have anything. Uh, we've only had a couple of inches. It was really cold, I don't know, two weeks ago. Really cold, like minus 33 one day. And then we were, and then we climbed back up. No snow. As I said, last week was, kept climbing. It was 50 degrees, 52, 55. Um, Here's the real question. Yeah. When it's not snowing in Bozeman in the middle of the winter, are you practicing your golf swing or are you fishing? I actually walked down to the river and that screwed up my hip. So, I could, <laughs> so I, no, the rivers are still frozen because it's obviously it's very cold at night. So, um, no, there's no, there's not much golf practice going on. I'm saving it ready for the, the spring. You know, I've got to, uh, I'll, um, I've got to get myself prepared some somewhere in the next couple of months you're going to get out there for the uh the waste management this week the wasted management yeah the wasted no, management yeah exactly no the good old days of doing that one was fun they get a quarter of a million people there on saturday and about three wow. about three they all walk around like this uh, and about three people know <laughs> what's that oh it's a golfer oh my is that what we're here for <laughs> we come to see the golf no it's, Aren't you in the scotch business though? If you're in the scotch business, isn't that like a good spot? To they be? don't drink. We, well, they don't drink my that stuff. <laughs> it's a lot way, of beer. Probably way, it's just beer. Beer, there, huh? beer, beer, yeah. beer. No, you wouldn't give them scotch. They would. They would definitely wouldn't. They wouldn't leave there alive. You know, it'd be. Uh, no, yeah, I am in the. Uh, yes, I'm an ambassador for a brand called Black Bull, and hopefully, it'll be coming to you soon. Nice, beautiful. Yeah, speaking of golf in the uh, the springtime, obviously, Sir Nick, we want to pick up with some history. We left off in uh, part two with the 1990s Masters, but I think we're creeping up now on 35 years. Yeah, I can believe that since the old Gosh, uh, the old the 89. first one, the first one. Yeah. So we 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 covered that a little bit last time, Sir Nick. But um, you know, anything special come to mind about that week for you now, looking back? Yeah, that many years ago about that first Masters victory? Well, I, well, I did a piece for the Augusta Chronicle last week because the, the writer says, oh, we're celebrating 25 years, your first win. I said, no, it's 35. <laughs> <laughs> that, that really hurts now. God, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm 66. I'm getting old, cheaper. So, uh, no, I, uh, it's, it's great. Obviously, it's great for me to reminisce. I did a, article the other day and you know it's like 
And they asked, do you have memories? Well, or do I dream of the masters? And I said, well, luckily I don't have to dream of it because I can actually, if I want to, I can sit down and recall what happened for real, which is probably even better than dreams, I guess. Um, no, it's so funny going through stuff again and, and remembering stories and what happened. You know, I bumped into Lee Trevino because we, we had to come in on, on Saturday because, you know, it was rain affected. And uh, we got driven back in. Uh, we were on the 13th green, just about short of the green, and they called play in the dark and the rain. And we jumped into the evacuation. <laughs> and Lee reminded me, he said, do you remember? It ran out of gas. Our evacuation van ran out of gas on the way back up to the clubhouse. I don't, I can't, I don't, I said, I don't remember. I don't know. What did we do? Did we walk? Do we have to get out and walk or something? So, yeah, all sorts of little things uh, um, obviously come back to memory now, which is always nice for me. So, Cernik, I look through all the comments of how people are responding. And, you know, there's a lot of guys asking, like, Tell us something that nobody's ever heard. So <laughs> give us some juicy story, maybe juicy not on the story. golf course, on the golf course or off the golf course from the Masters that, that you can only get here in the untold Cernic Faldo story. Juicy story? I can't think of a juicy story. What do you... Well, how, 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 how about this, Cernic? That first Masters you went in, at this point, were you like, you know, private jetting your way into Augusta. You're staying in mansions. Are they like, put you in the weekend? penthouse suite, renting you a house. Where do you stay? Yeah. Like, we don't know these things. Good old days. Uh, Courtyard Marriott. Courtyard Marriott. Come on. <laughs> Where do you actually stay? To, no, Courtyard. We drove, I assume we were in Greensboro before, and you probably, I'm wondering if you drive down from Greensboro. I can't, uh, I know we did mm. a couple of years, but no, but I stayed in the Courtyard Marriott, regular room. I got a feeling um, courtyard in back in the day was about 40 bucks, honest. And they, they charged us 110 bucks, I think, that particular week. So, you know, I, I, you know, because I remember going back, as I said, Saturday morning or Sunday morning, went back to have breakfast. And that's when I, you know, got the inspiration. I looked at, remember looking at the, the uh, starting times. I thought, you know, I could still win this. I mean, I've just shot 77. Uh, so that's a, I hold a record, a highest third round score of a champion. So that's pretty cool. So got that one. <laughs> and um, no, and then even funnier, um, I defended in 1990 from the Courtyard Marriott in the corner suite. If you know, you, there's four suites at the Courtyard Marriott, and you play, wow. and you pay 130 bucks. And yeah. <laughs> And that's, I defended the masters from the courtyard merit. How about that? <laughs> that would be, that would be never be equal. That would be never, nobody will ever be staying. No. Do they have your name on the room? Yeah, picture of it on the hallway. Yeah. <laughs> now they, there must be hundreds of houses on the rental list. Yeah. I need a blue plaque on that court. I should pop on bang on the door at, next time I'm there and say, Hey, do you, do you know which room? I think I might be in room 103. I was on the ground floor. I have to go and find that corner. Anyway, that's quite. <laughs> that's, that's a good that's story. That's seriously bad, isn't it? So, um, are you superstitious like that? I was that? just like, going to ask. Yeah, that. that's yeah. A, did you, you know, go back it, to that same spot because you won? No, I love I love numbers. I love numbers. I am a I'm a number freak. I always get inspired by numbers. Uh, I'll tell you why. And so, when I went back in '96, this is how sick you can get. Went back in '96 when I checked in. You, so you always you go in and sign the uh, registration, but go to registration and and wherever you, whenever you arrive and sign the book, there's a number and you get that number. If you're not the cha champion, gets number one, they leave that. But and so whenever you arrive, so I arrive in '96 and I got number sixty-seven. I looked at that. I thought, nice number, very nice, <laughs> lovely. I like that one. Because you know, obviously Caddy wears it on the bib and that sort of thing. And I go to get my car and they give you a car and I turn the key ring over and it says one, one, one. And I go, oh, that's a good number, isn't it? One, 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 thinking win, win, win. Seriously, that's how, how honest, honest as I sit here, that's how nutty you get. And um, so what do you think I shot on Sunday? 67 for my third wow. win. Sowing seeds, you see. 
you've got to sow the seeds. It. You know, you, ne you never know what might happen. After the victories, <laughs> do you go back to the courtyard, Mary, to celebrate? Are you up? Oh, no, here's the funny. Yeah, no, no. You know, so what happens when people don't realize you crumbs, you become champion. Wow. You do the ceremony, you go to press, and then you actually have to go back to the club. The club then has a dinner. And you sit there and have a dinner right. with the members, and you imagine, and the, and the chairman, and you're all in the, and because you're in a cloud, aren't you? You've just won the Masters the first time, that sort of thing. And it was Horde Hardin was the chairman then. And, um, oh, gosh, so, you know, you, you go through, I mean, you're not really there, are you? I mean, you can imagine your brain is absolutely spinning what has just happened and what's going to happen and what are you going to do next and that sort of thing so i was going to play and i did play i i went to hilton head went down and played and you you know because you're just in a daze and um you know you're kind of running on fumes and i so my son matthew had just been born three weeks before that and so you know after hilton head actually i spent some money i think we shot up to washington and went home on concord wow mm back in the day, which was always nice. And, um, or New York, can't remember which one. I, um, and the back again, back in the day, the pilots were very nice. You could, can't do it now. Fortunately, they used to say, Oh, do you want to come up the cockpit for uh, takeoff or landing or something? So I did, I sat in, can you believe it? I sat on the jump seat, um, uh, for both for, I sat up there for ages. I sat up there for takeoff out of New York, I guess, and then landing it. And then, because you fly from daylight to darkness and Concourse going so fast, it's going 1,200 miles. You actually can see the darkness, you know, you, on the horizon. You're going that fast that you see, you know, normally it's sunshine, isn't mm. it? Sunshine, sunshine forever, ever, ever. But no, you see sunshine, light gray, dark gray, charcoal, black within, I don't know, five minutes or 10 minutes or something like that, because you're hurtling along. And I even did a landing in London. How long did it take you to get back on the Concorde? Just it's only, it's just a, it's around three hours. Three hours. Just a, you know, it's half the time. Wow. Yeah, amazing. Talk about World Golf Tour. They got to bring the Concorde back. Yeah. It's a shame that playing cost a fortune and everything and, and uh, never worked well financially anyway. Wow. Yeah, very, very interesting. I know last time when we were asking you questions about the 1990, right, we had the um, defending the championship, and that's where we left off in the part two. And so I'm interested in from that 1990 victory, from then until the summertime, right, we go back to the Open championship and win another Open championship at the old course at St. Andrews. The time between Augusta and the Open, those couple of months, are you playing a bunch of tournaments in between? Are you practicing a lot? How's your game feel? Well, I yeah, I must have gone back and played. Um, you know, obviously I played great at um, should have, could have at uh, Medina. You know, I at that U.S. Open, I had a chance. Uh, I was driving so badly that week. I drove over one iron most of the week, and I couldn't care less that I was back here and guys were hitting for because something was up with whatever the swing and couldn't hit a driver very well um, and I had a serious chance I know I three putted somewhere late like the on the 16th hole for a bogey yeah, that's what. The, and then where do you get that from? You get the you got the. I got the computer up right. I got my cheat sheet sitting right oh, in front blimey. of me. Oh, yeah, I three putted that green, and that hurt. And that's that's the time when the the uh, somebody you were walking off to the locker room, and someone said like you hit a bad putt, and you were like, I did not. I was only one foot past the hole. You remember that story? No, no, I don't remember that. No, no, no. That see that he forgets all that. <laughs> I like that. So I had a real genuine chance at the last. I hit a. See, I had one iron and a six iron, and people made a big fuss about that. But I had a chance. I had a 20-footer, and I hit the hole to tie, And I, but I was upset. So that's being – I mean, I went back. In the, I went in the clubhouse, and I sat in the loo. I cried, honestly, and I because I'd blown a chance, I guess. So I sat there, and I vowed I'm going to win the Open at St. Andrews. So I really did go there on a mission – 
and um not sure i guess we would have played somewhere like the french or the irish before that and then we played scotland which was always glen eagles which was great because you were on fescue grass and um you know i loved it. i wasn't worried about what i was going to shoot i just just play and just work on things obviously it worked before from i went from glen eagles to muirfield when i won um the first one so this time round, you know, it was, well, I can remember driving across Sunday, no, Saturday, because we, back in the good old days, they used to play, they used to qualify on Saturday and Sunday. So we finished the tournament on a Saturday. So I remember driving over and went out and played on the Sunday and just started working on things. And, um, you know, looking at the golf course and the way I was playing, you know, I said to myself, luckily to myself, not the media, you know what they're like now. The, I just thought, you know, 67 is my par. I thought I could shoot 67 around here. And, um, you know, my irons were that good. And so that was really the strategy. Uh, but I was suffering. At that, that time, I was suffering. I got hot forearms. I got a bit of tendonitis going on. So actually, I wore, and the, and the range was solid as that table. So I hit a lot of practice shots of a TPEX that week. I mm. teed it up. Not such a bad thing. Keeps the swing free and um, putting great. Got my, my magic putter. And so so here's the funny story. So the morning of we're about to start, you know, the wind's changed a bit. It's now into the wind at one. And um, Led, David Ledbetter came back to me at the range. He said, Everybody's coming up short, you know, put the flag on you know, at six or seven yards over the over the burn, and everybody's coming up short on one. I said, okay, right, clock that. So we had one iron off the tee, I think. So I'm thinking, so I've got nine, I know I've got nine iron distance into one. So I go, all right, be smart, take an eight. So I've got an eight in my hand. Then the wind picks up. So I go, all right, be smart, grab a seven. So I'll chip a seven. So because I chip a seven, because straight through the wind, I'm on the back of the green, and the pin's on the front. I've got a 30 freaking five-yard putt. And I've, oh, gee. And it's so luckily, I um, I putted it down there to a foot. So fine, I waltzed, waltzed off the green. And honestly, and I just said to my, how about this for a line? I said to myself, look, just relax. You're going to win. So how about that for a line? Yeah. So you can say it 30 years later because people but uh, but uh, honest that's what i said to myself just relax you're gonna win so wow that was the the mission i was on and that and my irons were good everything was good um you know and i putted great i honestly don't how about this another i don't remember missing how about that for a feeling you know i was brushing in anything or hitting great i had some great i, I had some great irons you know, some wacky but i had one of the best six irons of my life 13 i, th I guess day two uh because i shot 67 because i shoot oh so that so the story okay so the, the the next part of the story is i uh, you know i've set the goal of 67 and i and i'm coming up the last and i'm three under and i look at the big leaderboard and i got that chip shot with a bump and run at 18 you know i'm about 30 yards short of the green or something and so you know i'm kind of like off schedule and i look up and i saw uh i guess 64 was probably in already and i'm only three under you see so I'm kind of off schedule. and i honestly looked at that chip shot i thought oh i could hold this so how about that and so you and i thought if i land it there it will kick onto that hill and bump over and so i read it all like the bump bump round rut and up you had to go up the valley of sin and it's going up sideways so the thing has got to be whatever 15 foot right of the flag you know when it touches the green because it's going to go up and go whoosh to hard right to left and because i hit this thing a bonk 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 diddly do dot and in and that's why i had that that's why i had that reaction that was you know thirsty reaction never you know the one when i like this because yeah. I'd now shot 67. I was kind of on schedule. So it's amazing. So yeah, that was that day. And then I come out the next day and I hit a couple of really good shots. I hit a six sign 
I hit it on the bank of 13. Actually, that's the that's the sixth hole. You'd be always used to play over onto the sixth fairway to get an angle, but I've gone a bit, you know, it's dry. I've gone a bit too far. I'm on the, I'm in the dust on a downhill lie, and I hit this six iron to two foot off that lie. I mean, the swing was still, you know, I was still parallel, and I'm standing in the. Yeah, it was really, yeah. As I said, one of the best six irons I've ever hit. Hit that one there, and I think I hit it. A seven iron at 16, I think I hit that to two feet as well. And I shot 65. And so, so I shot 65, six, 67, 65, and Norman shot 65, 67. So we're both 12 under. So that's when we played together on the Saturday, which obviously was build up big again. And, you know, that was that was, I guess, like two boxes coming out the gates. It's make make an impression. We both had what twelve footers on one. He misses, I make, and I went waltzing off, and I kept brushing putts in. And I sh and I shot sixty seven again, and that gave me a five shot lead. So, um, which is a weird feeling to deal with, you know, when you've got that big a lead. Mm. And so, back in that time, to kill to kill time. Because you know you're teeing off at three fifteen plus, and I got my little kids are with me, and I'm standing in the hotel right there. So you know kids are up at six in the blooming morning, so you're you're already up and you got to kill all that time. I actually used to go over and do a full full mini practice session. So I used to wander over to the range, hit, go through the whole clubs, do a bit of chipping, bit of putting, and then go back to the hotel. Amazing. I I could even go back to the hotel and have. I had some lunch, even had a snooze. How about that? And then wow. started again. Yeah, and then went back again and started again and did the whole thing. It was really, it was more just to kill time. Keep yourself moving and kill time. So, but but somebody said something to me on Punning Green I, and it it kind of disturbed me. It's like, so how, what's my strategy? It was like you, know, like, you can't blow a five shot lead. And you're like, oh, thanks sort of thing. Um, and you think, well, what are you, what's your strategy to you go for it? As meaning going for it with your putts, really, because I'm like, you know, the green, you're going to hit the greens. But so do you go for it, knock it four foot past, miss it, and then you kick yourself, wouldn't you? would be like, can't, don't want to waste a shot. Mm. So I came out probably a bit too, a little bit defensive, not sure what to do. And then it, and then it all came alive on the, Suddenly, Payne Stewart, dear old Payne, got within two of me as I was coming down 15. And I had a great shot. I had a little one. I knocked down five irons again to about eight feet and made that. And that gave me the cushion. And I think he must see he, he finished poorly because even though I bogeyed 15, 17 almost like intentionally, that was smart play to play for a five to avoid a seven, you know, just in case. And, um, hey, and I ended up winning by five again. So um, that was amazing. That was a, probably one of the greatest feelings to walk down 18 at St. Andrews. To, and I said to Fanny, lift your head up, have a look. Take it in, girl. Mm. We won't get a chance like this again. So, um, you know, to be able to walk up and that, because most of the time when you're, you know, you're winning, well, coming up 18, you you still have got the blinkers on because you you need four to win. Well, you're not. There's none of this. You you've got to stay completely in this, in yourself, haven't you? So finally, I walked up and I could take it all in. They're running through the crowd and all that. So it was a obviously a great great feeling. Gosh, it's fascinating, mm. fascinating to hear these. That's the that's the short version of <laughs> how to win an open. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it was whole everything. That was a bit. I, I must. Yeah, I heard three things. Yeah. I heard whole everything. Forget the things that go wrong. I didn't even remember a putt, the putts that I missed. Relax, I'm gonna and have a goal. Yeah. Have a secret goal. Yeah, it, isn't that amazing? Yeah, isn't that amazing? You know, to, 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 you know, so if, you know, like, you know, when, yeah, Paul, when Bryson blurted out the, the par 67, everybody went nuts. But you're meant to say that mm. inside you. You're meant to look. If you look at a golf course, go, oh, fancy this one. I mean, if I play nicely. And that's how I felt. You know, I felt if I played well, you know, the par fives were, actually 14 was always difficult. 14 in our era was a three-shotter. 
and we had to and we had to lay up sideways. You hit it down the fairway, you got hell bunker in front of you, and we actually used to go left of hell. And so that's the fifth. Uh, where are we now? So that's the fourth fairway. Is that right? Is that the fourth fairway? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> trying to work out. I think that's the fourth fairway. Yeah, you got to work out where which bit, you know. So you went at an angle to get, because St. Andrew's got this big mound on the front right, I mean, huge mound on the front right corner of the green and the big mega force edge, which were a big roll off. And they put the pin behind, so you used to go way over here to get an angle. I mean, we're chipping seven iron. It's not like, oh, go that way and that wedge. No, you're then chipping a seven iron for your third. Um, so, you know, completely different strategy to, to now. But, um, but you know, I was, I loved that golf course when it played firm because, you boy, you did you have to calculate. Like the seventh green, which is like this, all the way down the green. So you've got, you might have 135 to the hole, but you might have to land it at 110. You've got a wedge. When have you ever landed at 25 yards short intentionally with a wedge in your hand? Because it goes, boing, you know, we were so good at, we it was, it's calculated guesses, isn't it? Or professional guesses, as I would call them, where you think, well, my ledge, wedge is going to land here. It's light rock, down stone. It will, it will bounce. We even worked out what a bounce would be. So a bounce might be 15 yards, and then it's going to go skip, 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 and it's going to take 10 more to stop. So you had to know these sort of, you know these things. You know, downwind landing down slope took any club, anything from, 20 to 40 yards to stop the darn thing. So you have to kind of know thing and then obviously go turn it around into the wind. It might stop in four yards. So it's, that's why you, you love, I love playing links when you're playing well, because you've got all that calculation to do. And if you do it, well, then you get rewarded because the other guy didn't, the other guy hopefully is not as smart as you and doesn't quite get it as right. So to get it close at St. Andrews, I always said, you know, in a golf, in a regular golf course, you hit it ten feet from the pin and twenty feet, thirty feet. At St Andrews, it finishes ten yards from the hole and twenty yards from the hole. It gets multiplied there, really does. So even good shots, you walk up to the green, and you think, oh, bloody hell, you know, this is a twenty-two yard putt, and I thought I had a decent shot, <laughs> you know. So um, amazing what you have to. What do you have to deal with? And, now, and after a while, you start fancying a 20 yarders. You know, you start, oh, but uh, yeah, I could make this. So it's weird. From the Masters a couple months earlier through to the US Open, through to the Open, swing feels wise and things you were working on in your game. During that whole period, did you have like one or two swing cues that you had the whole time? Were you changing things with the swing feels? Yeah. No, they would be the same because the iron shots uh, got the, that that year. My irons were really good, so uh, I guess that this what I was doing, which was nice. Nice when I heard Trevino saying, you know, he never hit two shots the mm. same. You know, I I'd be on the range hitting fades and draws, fades and draws all the time. When I tipped the bag out, I never hit two shots the same. Mm. And well, why not just hit fade, draw, fade, draw? So just do it with every club, even all the way through to three wood. You know, fade, draw. And if you're good, you see it fly how you want it to fly. Um, just, you know, as I said, if you get really good, you're just letting it tip. It just falls to the right, falls to the left. Don't have to have big swoopers, that sort of thing. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think what else was. I mean, I think the swing was pretty simple. My swing was really, was, um, was really um, driven by really good body action good hips good good torso i think i you know being a tall guy it's how well you turn mm. your torso isn't it your chest backward and through and if you're doing that consistently as opposed to this you know and i think that was the key with me i've done it millions of times and got this consistency where I, and you're striking the ball so darn well when you do that really well, you're delivering the ball and you're crunching it all the time, which, which means 
the ball will fly and land your intended distance. That's the other important thing, is it? If you if you don't do that, all those calculations I was talking about, waste of time, aren't they? If you can't land it on that downslope to make the thing release, so that's the reward, you know. If you, so I'm I was very driven by shoulder action and that sort of thing, and you know, and a good, and a, obviously a very very good strike hit the ball really really crunchy solid that week this may be a difficult question to answer but if we could ballpark it if you had to put like a percentage when you're on the course mm. is there any percentage of you like hey i'm thinking 80 percent about the ball flight i'm trying to hit and 20 percent about my swing and how i'm doing it is it 100 90 10 like no well you well there's a process isn't it so when, again it's a good question so when you arrive on the links the first thing is trajectory mm. that's the first thing you got to look at so when you look at your light, you assume your light is all right, you look up there, the first thing is the shot and the wind. And you see, and the wind's coming, whatever level, it's always blowing, isn't it? And you like, I, so you visually seeing it, it's got to fly like that to get through the wind. So, so if you've got 170 yard, yard shots, it seems to be kind of like the length shot, well then you've got to then, if you're looking, it's, it's got to fly at that level. It can't fly at that level, so it's not sevens and eights. And it doesn't need to be here, so it's not threes and fours. So it's like, you know, it's five and sixes. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the yardage, yeah, almost regardless of the yardage, you like, I know that these two clubs sort of thing in your mind will give me that trajectory. So you, you pick the club to the trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you do. So if you think, well, a six won't get me there, well, you've got to go with five at the, the right, and that's when you get your little knockdown shots. Because, But I always thought on a Lynx, trajectory rules. So you pick the trajectory. It's got to fly at that height and that penetration to stay on line. Simple as that. To carry what you want and stay on line. So I think once you've established that, then you then go, so that's bits done, isn't it? So then you get your true yardage. And you think, yeah, right, it's a five. And then you have to, as I said, then you've got to calculate, well, I've got 175. And then you're like, well, wind direction means, if you're into it, well, it means that we can land it at 170. So then you find your landing spot, depending on the wind and the green, so if the, you know, and the slope. So you put, you're calculating all this. So it's like, so that's, a, and that's an E to them. So when you get the opposite, so they, so, as I was saying, when you get the one slightly downwind, wow, so you've got 175, Mm, so we got a what's 155 so you'd have your yardish but one, 155 it's up slope or a down slope at 155 get me so you you go well you probably would know it you'd have the picture in your head um you you know the greens when you walk up you kind of know it this one's down here up there da -de da so then you that's when you pick yeah, if I fly a really good seven, it's going to land on that 55 downslope, should kick forward. Yeah, so that's how you, and that's how you piece it all together. Mm. So that's when the real importance comes back to, well, you better strike it, right? Because if you miss that landing spot, you hit the upslope instead of the downslope, then you're 30 yards, back to what I was saying, then you're 30 yards from the bloody hole rather than 30 feet. And so... So you can see if you can consistently do that, you're basically outplayed 95% of the field because you're, you're just better. Your, your, your whole strategy, your whole, ex your whole thinking strategy, execution is a little bit better than everybody else. So that's, so you can, you know, my goal, you've heard me talk about, you know, that 15 foot circle, if you're around that, more than the other guys, you've got way less stress, number one. You know, you've got chances. 30 feet all day is hard work, isn't it? Yeah, you're going to, you've got more chance of three putting than, than holding it. From 15 feet, you're just thinking, how do I hold this? How do I hold this? How do I, hold? you're not thinking of a three putt ever from there. So that I always thought was the key thing to, you know, that the um, proximity to hole, as we now call it. Back in my day, it was only the, the 15 foot. I thought my 15, I'm sure my 15 foot circle was 18 feet. Who cares? But it was still a, a chance, a birdie chance. So, um, but that's how you used to 
So you've got to do that all the way around the golf course. So you get, so you can imagine you've got crosswinds to deal with. Um, as we, as you know, you turn an A-tine on a wind and it lands on a Lynx, you can, you could get 15, 20 yards of run, couldn't you? For sure. You, you cut an A-tine against the wind, might stop in two. So that's, that's another decision, another decision to make and what shot to hit and when to put it, all that sort of thing. So that's how the skill of being able to work the golf ball against the wind. So, so that's the better way to rather having that um, um, element of you're not quite sure, are you, how it's going to react. That's why we always, you see a pro working against the wind all the time because we want the blimmin' thing to sit down as quick as possible. And on the links, sitting down as quick as possible might be still 10 yards, hmm. you know, to get the thing to stop. And the right, I mean, some greens like the eighth green, my goodness, you hit it over there and you get it, you get the wind wrong and you're 40 yards off line. <laughs> so, but so to work it in there and get it in there close is a, it's a different quality shot than the other guy can hit, you know? And w once you go through the thought process and you make a decision on what you want to do, what's going through your mind during, let's say the practice swings, or even when you're over the ball, getting ready to hit? Any, you know. Yeah, no, well, then you've made your decision. So if we're fading it, then I would have my, you know, it might be two, I had two types of fade. I had a hold off fade, which would basically keep the right, the right wrist at this angle through impact, which is basically keep the face a smidgen open. Mm -hmm. I, and I'd hit my high fade with that. And then I had my chicken wing when I used to really break this and do it. So the ball was kind of went off as a, like like a professional block in a way just went guaranteed to go so I, between those two shots so you sort of the bottom line is you make a decision isn't it was you once you've assessed the shot you visualized it and then you know what swing produces that so that's then and that's commitment so it's so, so it's all lots of and if it's all going well that hopefully happens in a few seconds you know and then you've got to stand up and commit to that so then that's then that's the the fifth element or more. Um, that's confidence, nerve, trust through practice. You know? So that's yeah. the real piece it all together. And that's how you end up pulling the right club and hitting the right shot. I've got one more and then I'll stop asking you questions about this. This is all just very fascinating to hear for me. You know, Nicholas used to talk about in his pre-shot, he almost see himself hit the shot, like visualize the movie and Jason Day. Did you, when you, are you a guy that was visualizing the shot patterns at all that you were hitting before you hit them? Would you see like the lines? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Jack caught it going to the movies, mm. didn't he? Uh, which I read back as a kid. And Tiger caught it putting into the picture. That's where he hit it into the picture. So he created it. Yeah. So I was good at that. So I, I self developed that ability to stand. So it started with, I could, you stand behind the ball and you see the golf ball fly, you see it land. And the important thing is you've got to see it finish. You can't just see it fly off and with a hook or a fade. So you picture the whole thing. So if you want to see a draw, you come back at like a little bit of an angle because your swing's got to go that way and do, and you see it fly. But the really important thing, folks, is you've got to see it finish. Mm -hmm. See it sitting there wherever you want it, three foot from the hole or 15 feet right of the hole. You've got to see it finish, okay? And... Then I then developed, I then stood back at times and then I could see myself as a ghost. I could put myself in there and see my shoulders turn, see the club go and see my finish. So I've, I've then visualized the feeling. So I'm standing back feeling that. That's another great thing. Sebi used to say, you know, you've got to feel it in your, not just, you know, when Sebi used to do this around the greens, but he said, you know, to, to me, he said, you've got to feel it in your body as well. And I went, oh yeah, that's better than just your hands. You stand back and you can feel it. You can see yourself. Do, you can sort of go with the flow, you know, the momentum, and you'd see this. So you visualize a certain part of your body being key, whatever you like. Shoulders have got to move. Arms are going to go through like that, and you're going to wrap it around your neck. And, you, and I use verbal commands like that as well. So if I, had a, if I wanted to make a full follow through, I used to say wrap it around my neck. Because if I've got, if I've com fully completed, then guess what? The body's done the right thing. Or if you've seen the chicken wings, you've got to see what you want to do, 
right? It's just very powerful. If you can do that, stand back, see yourself do it, and then boom, then you stand up and then commit to it. And then if you like, and then suddenly so obviously take a practice swing if you wish. I mean, but I, I did obviously. And then you kind of like, you get the feeling and go, oh, that feels good. That's powerful. And if the mm-hmm. voice says, if, yeah, if the voice says, well, that doesn't feel good, then you do it again. You know, and then you go, okay, I'm ready. And then and you stand up and commit. So once you, so all of that is, very, I think, very important. You know, some, and so even when Jack didn't have practice swings, he could, you can still sit there even now and see a golf swing and feel the momentum in your body, can't you? See it, feel it, mm-hmm. speak it, believe it, do it. Yeah. Yeah, but you can feel it. You can go, whoa. You can feel it without even moving. You can feel the momentum of a golf, your body turning. Ugh. And then, so even though guys are standing back there, like Jack didn't take practice swings, but I know that he felt it before he hit it. You know, you have to see it, feel it, do it. I mean, that's very simple formula and very powerful. And then, you know, and then, and then for for fun later in life, I say I used to say to amateurs, well, if you if you can't do it, you never have and you never will. Who can do it? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, my day it would be whatever my swing or Greg or Pricey or that sort of thing. Where you pretend Ernie else was a good anybody with a good tempo. So I copied the guys with good tempos and that sort of thing. Um, or now you've got, you know, Rory and all sorts, J-Day or whatever you... Um, if you can visualize them doing it and hitting a good shot, then you stand up and do it. Pretend you're them. It's a very powerful, very powerful way of doing things. My, uh, I think back on my junior golf days, I certainly didn't win any open championships, but I won some little local tournaments. I used to always feel like I was Freddie Couples out there. I used to think I was Freddie Couples, real smooth. That's really when I played my best. I think it's interesting on that, Sir Nick. Amateur golfers, certainly they need to improve their golf swings, right? If they're, if their golf swings relative to a good ball striker, let's say are like a three or four out of 10, they're like a zero out of 10 at what you just talked about. Oh, yeah. They spend very little time on the visualization, the seeing themselves hit the shot. I think there's huge room for improvement. Yeah, we rush into the shots. I mean, the, there's no standing behind and it, seeing it, feeling it, believing it, speaking it, and then doing it. People think it's that's too difficult. You know, they say, oh, I can't do that. Well, I got, I got really good dear friends. One guy, is, he's, a, he's an artist. So that, you have a professional artist. I said, well, just stand here and paint the bloody picture as you look at the golf. And he's like, oh, yeah, I agree. I said, well, now paint the golf ball fly. Oh, yeah. And then, and, and then I'd ask his, and I'd, it's funny, I'd ask his wife, where do you want to do it? I just, I just want to hit it. I said, well, guess what's going to happen? You're just going to hit it. I said, so he said to, where would you like it to finish by the flag? I said, oh, 10 feet right. I said, well, can you see it? Yes. Yeah, Where do you think it finished? 10 feet right. Honest. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. You've just got to keep, and that's the hardest thing with golf. You've just got to, you've got to wear that out. When you're playing badly as a pro, wow, you've just got to keep wearing that out. You've got to have, you've got to have that inner belief. Okay, this time, this time, this time. It's all right, keeps it. Because as soon as you give in, you know, golf's going to beat you, you know. So it's it's definitely one of the most powerful things. You, we, we're doing it naturally in the day, and we don't realize. And because um, I was, I used to love it when, oh, my gosh, talk about, you know, when a sports psychologist says, you've got to think of nothing when you swing. <laughs> if I want to go to the restroom right now, what do I have to do? So I've been to the restroom Tens of thousands of times in my life, I have to go, mm, I've got a feeling, oh, I need to go, so there's number one. And I go, oh, yeah, there's a loo around the corner. So I then go, oh, then there's steps there. I've got to get down, and it's rounding that. Door. So what have I just visualized to get to the loo? Honest, you do it. You sit at home and go, I need to go to the loo. And, you, and you'll go, yeah, well, it's upstairs, well, it's downstairs, it's around the corner, and off you go. So you cannot tell me you can stay, you were meant to play golf without thinking of anything. Just think of something, but not 24 things, agreed. But if you, it won't do you any harm if you said, I'm going to finish and look like whoever my hero is, whether it's way back from Sam Snead or Ben Hogan or Rory now. If you 
stood there on every show and go, oh, I'm going to finish and feel I'm, I'm finished like Rory. You are way ahead of all your buddies going, oh, I'm going to, I'm a jellyfish. <laughs> Yeah, I think the amateur tendency <laughs> is to just default to mechanics. It's like the, they do. Well, they the people have told them don't think of anything, and it, but <laughs> <laughs> I know I can promise you. Just think, and actually, I'm, I'm helping you. I'm trying to help. As I, as I think it this way, the follow through rather than that way. Mm. If you're gonna think, if you if you really struggle, just do exactly as I said. Pretend you're finishing like Hogan, Jack, whoever your hero is, anything. Just try that, please. Just fit on all your shots, mm -hmm. on all your shots, even a four foot putt. Finish like who's your favorite putter? Go, oh, he finishes, he holds his follow through like that. Oh my God, you will be doing yourself wonders if you could do that. If you could all do that. Oh God. Wouldn't you agree? God, if you could all stand there and go, who's the best finish follow through? Tiger, or if I could hold the finish like that, and it's gonna ball's gonna roll, and hit every chip shot he hit, oh yeah, Lee Trevino finished like that. Oh, finish, just copy them. I promise you'll have fun. You'll have a lot of fun, and you'll and you'll be shocked that oh, well that one worked. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Hang on. I just pretended. Honestly, I used to get when I used to get in the horrendous bunker. You know, we used to walk up and think, oh my god. You're in a bunker, the grass is this. That. I should say, okay, well, what will Sevy do? Well, Sevy would go, okay, I get, you know, I find a way to hold this. <laughs> you've gone from looking, you seriously, you've gone from looking and think, oh, crap, how am I going to get out of here? And you know darn well, Sevy said, oh, yeah, I open the face. And I, and I get in there, you mess around, you pretend you're Sevy, you go, and it, I guarantee it's better than when you first, your first thought of what you can do to try it. It's good I like fun. that too. It almost takes the pressure off of you when you're like pretending to be someone else. And yeah, it yeah. does. It does doesn't it? Put all put all the blooming responsibility on the. Well, it's back to what I said. If you think you can't do it, where are you on the confidence scale? You're at zero if you don't think you can do it. Right? I never yeah. have. I've never hit this green before. Never will. Okay, so you're at zero. So if you then go, well, whoever your hero is, well, of course he would just knock it over the pond. 10 feet from the hole. So now you're at here already. Uh, there's, a, there's a serious chance you could do it. Well, I'll just pretend I'm in. Well, what, no point pretending yourself if you're a zero. Pretend uh, it may not work, but you'd, at least you started better than the zero. You didn't, you, it was, there, was some, there was some hope to it or, you know, or optimism or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that, that, that was awesome. I, I honestly feel like I could ask another 20 questions on visualization, but for the sake of time, I think we'll close there for part three, Sir Nick. Um, in part number four, obviously I want to shift into the next Open Championship in 92 in Muirfield, but um, we'll call that episode three. Thank you. Very fascinating to hear the stories behind the scenes of the tournaments. I think some of the stuff we talked about will help a lot of amateur golfers. Yeah. Thank you. It's the power of the mind. Just go see it. Visualize it. Go see it. <laughs> Speak it. And do it. Believe it. Do, do it. it. Cool. Yeah. Boom. Thanks, Sir Nick. All right. Have fun.